I first came to this country in 1979 to study. I came for three years and uh, when my three years were finished, I went back home. But prior to my coming here, my mother came here, my uncles came here, my aunts, they came here too in the 50s. And what we didn't know as children growing up in Jamaica at the time was the inhumane treatment that they got from mother country. What we didn't know because they were too embarrassed. One of the things about uh, Caribbean people, and I would specifically say uh, about my Jamaican people, we, when we are embarrassed, we don't talk about those situations because, you know, we, we feel ashamed. We feel ashamed. We haven't done anything, but we feel ashamed that people should treat us like this. And so we knew nothing of the fact that there were signposts saying no blacks, no Irish, no dogs in relation to them trying to find a place to live. So they put up with those inhumane uh, treatments in order to make a life, as it were, in order to survive here in the harshness, in the harsh climate. So I went back to Jamaica after I finished my studies and then later on I came back because I'm, I happened to be married to someone who was a student at college at the time. He came over to Jamaica, we got married and then he wanted to come back here to live. One of the realities is that we as a British people, we have often gone to other far-flung parts of the world. And we didn't go there simply because we, we thought it was a great idea to have a holiday. We went there because we wanted to make a better life. In other words, we were economic migrants. We were economic migrants when we went to New Zealand, Australia, Africa, the Caribbean, the Americas. We were trying, we wanted to make a good life for ourselves and for our families. That's what people are wanting to do who want to come here. So sometimes we hear people say, oh, they're not refugees. Oh, they're not asylum seekers. They're economic migrants. So what? Of course they're economic migrants. Some of them are. The reality is that as a nation, as countries in the West, we're going to have to take a lead in creating the type of economic policies globally that ensures who in their right mind want to leave their sunny, beautiful country to come to a freezing cold country. It doesn't make sense. Who wants to leave their beautiful beach-like environment, travel for days or weeks on a broken down uh, ship or boat, risking their lives to go somewhere else where they're going to see vans telling them to go home, where they're going to be paid 20 pound or 40 pound for working hard for a whole day. It does not make sense. And so we need, we need to see policies, whether through the United Nations, through the G8 or G7, or whatever number they are now, we need to see the type of policies created that will ensure that people can enjoy a decent standard of living in their own countries. Now, that is not going to happen if we continue to move jobs from here, why? Because somebody's going to make it cheaper in Bangladesh, in parts of Africa, in other parts of Europe. It is not going to happen. The reality is, you move jobs there, you pay them peanuts, and pat them on the head, and you know how wonderful you know we are we are being because we're sending them jobs. No, you're not sending them jobs. You are sending them hell because 
in, in, on the one hand, they are working all hours, night and day, and they cannot meet the needs, the basic needs of their families. So I think that is something that we need to look at. When we go on about people coming here, the 26 million that Mr. Farage is speaking about, when he says people are coming here and taking our jobs, we need to think again about why it is that we are allowing people in this country. And it's no good saying, oh, it's a free market. That's not good enough. We cannot be paying people 40 pounds a day for work when they have families to care for, when they have bills to be paid. And so there, there has to be some control in terms of wages. And it's not something we like to hear mentioned in the West because we like the free market to run its course and have its own way. And then the other thing that I would, I'm going to say very briefly, then I'll, I'll be quiet, because I know you've got lots of questions and comments to make, is that actually this is not about governments, past, present, or future. This is actually about you and me. You see, governments create ridiculous policies because they are afraid of what you are going to do in the ballot box. They think that they are answering your questions. So hence why they're all jumping up and down on this bandwagon of immigration. So you have got to speak up. You cannot let the, the, a minority of people who are sometimes um, saying what they're saying from a deeply racist perspective. And I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying we shouldn't have a decent debate about immigration. Yes, of course we need to. But I'm not convinced that the debate that we see in our media at the moment is from uh, a genuine uh, desire for uh, concern about immigration. I think there is something else below it, behind it, around it, and I find it disturbing. We do face, at a critical juncture, a need to engage in a political debate about those central notions of equality, human dignity, respect, and racism, because at heart, we have to challenge what is happening to foreign nationals as an issue of race. And it's been one of the most shocking developments that I've seen in a long time, that the BBC had a programme on television, and then there was a widespread publicity about it, that the immigration debate is no longer about race, because European nationals are white. So if you don't want a person, if you want to say, keep out, because you're a, a Bulgarian or a Pole, that's not racism because the person's not white. Now, if that, that is where we've got to in the mainstream media. And we have to have a voice. And that voice has to be articulated fundamentally around the principle of equality. We're at the stage now where you've got the immigration bill coming through. You've got loads of prolific little issues going on around the country, but everything is being talked about at the national level. Well, I'll just give you two quick examples um, of things that are happening in London boroughs that, if not challenged, are going to proliferate around the country. The London borough of Newham is not known for its liberal attitude towards integration, even though it's one of the most diverse boroughs in the country. And one of the things they've done there is they've taken away all community language newspapers from public libraries there in a bid to help people learn English. Well, ladies and gentlemen, The Voice and The Asian Times are in English. Why have they been taken away? The problem we have around issues like that is there is no mechanism for challenge them. We are seeing less resources put into the legal aid system that can actually help challenge this. But also there's a lack of willingness. Voluntary groups, NGOs are petrified of putting their head above the parapet for fear of loss of funding. We need organisations to step up to the mark. Ranfair has lost dear. We, we, we have lost dear. We've lost a lot of funding because funders are a little bit worried about us. Well, actually, that's their problem. Because for every funder who has questioned us and said to us, we think you're too political, 
I ask you, how can you work in immigration and not be political? How can you ask the questions that so many people need answering to and not engage with your local politicians? We're in Perda at the moment and we've got a very difficult issue in the London Borough of Barkin and Dagenham who have just announced, coincidentally just before the local elections, that they, and this is the Labour Council, that they are extending their qualifying period if, uh, for anybody who wants um, social housing from two years to ten years. That's wiping out a whole generation and it's shooting themselves in the foot because let's not forget as well as many BME communities are able and eligible to vote as well and we sometimes forget that. So I'll just end on the fact that actually when it comes down to campaigning we are restricted by the campaigning law we're in, oh, that will go through. We're restricted by our own fears as organisations about taking risks and about taking chances. <laughs> Statelessness is the issue that I really wanted to raise with you today. <laughs> I conveniently forgot to mention, but um, this is our um, this is our big final battle in the immigration bill. That we had a fan, you know a fantastic result in the House of Lords, and we had you know peer after peer, you know the, the most kind of prominent legal speakers in the House of Lords stand up and tell us that you know not only is this statelessness inhumane, it will create kind of huge problems for our diplomatic relations. It will make us less secure because we're going to have situations where you know we are <coughs> leaving people, people who potentially are you know, suspected of. of of, of meaning as harm, even if it's loose and undocumented. If people are suspected of criminality, then we should deal with them in the criminal justice system, with criminal due process, with fair trial protections, and you know everything that goes along with criminal due process. The idea that we should sort of hark back to these really archaic, um, you know, medieval exile type uh, approaches it, it is really, really beyond the pale. And what we're asking members and, and supporters of liberty to do is email their MPs about this. We think this is going to be back in the Commons on the 7th of May, we expect, unless we have some kind of government concession in the meantime. Um, and we really want to put this on the radar of our of our MPs because it got, you know, it had an hour's debate roughly in the Commons. That was all because it was a late stage amendment and we really need a proper fight back on, the, on this in the Commons.